It's great to see you this morning. Derek is, uh, I think he's preaching at sunset this morning and down in Albany tonight. So he, he has gone both services today or, or it's reverse of that one way or another. And so be, uh, be keeping him in your prayers. Good, ch good songs, Chad. I really enjoyed those songs this morning. I want to talk about the past. I want to talk about the past this morning. There can be a lot of unpleasant memories of the past. A lot of mistakes that we've made back there, sins back there. That's not something new, though. I don't know if you've ever realized over in Hebrews 11 and in verse 31, we know Rahab. We know that Rahab had been a harlot, and yet that had been passed, and she manifested great faith. But over in Hebrews 11, 31, even after, even centuries looking back, the Hebrew writer says, by faith Rahab the harlot. There's her past, still there. Still there. That had to have been a painful memory for Rahab. Rahab had changed and she became part of Israel and she's mentioned among the Israelites and she's faithful and yet that is something that was in her past that she could probably never really forget about. Paul, before Paul became a Christian, Paul had persecuted Christians. In the book of 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 13 through 15, Paul says, even though I was formerly a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent aggressor, and it looks like what Paul says there is that, and I was pretty angry about it. In Acts chapter 9, it talks about Saul still breathing out threats and slaughter. Saul could be a very angry man. Especially when he thought when he thought people were doing the wrong thing. But the grace of our Lord was more than abundant with the faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. It is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners among whom I am foremost of all. But that must have been a painful memory for Paul that he had persecuted Christians, that he had been there and held the garments when Stephen was stoned, that he had been all for Stephen's death, that he had dragged men and women into prison. That could not have been a pleasant memory to think about. Many Christians in the first century came from rough, rough backgrounds. You learn that in 1 Peter chapter 4. You take a look at the, the life that these Christians came from. They had, as Peter says, so as, there is the less, so as to live the rest of the time in the flesh no longer for the lust of man. That's what they had been doing, verse 2. For the time already passed is sufficient for you to carry out the desire of the Gentiles. Then he says, having pursued a course of, then we have sensuality and lust, drunkenness, carousals, drinking parties, abominable idolatries. And certainly those are not pleasant memories to think about. That they had done those things. That they had led other people astray. What makes the difference? One writer said, having God makes the difference. Many people have noted that what makes the difference in overcoming something is having someone who believes in you and that you can trust. And I can't think of a better person to have on your side than the all-powerful, all-knowing, loving, ever-present God who says you can change, who believes in you. And you can trust him with all your heart. Psalm 27, verse 10. Depending on your translation, this may read a little differently as far as the tenses. For my father and my mother have forsaken me. I think some translations render it if they do. But the Lord will take me up. I may have been abandoned by my own parents. But I've got God. If they ever do abandon me or sell me out, but I've got God. If the, if the most intimate of my relationships fail, earthly relationships, I've still got God. Or could we say, if I lose my wife, if my kids want to have nothing to do with me, still got God. So that we confidently say, the Hebrew writer said, the Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. What shall man do to me? 
Why does a relationship with God help so many people? Number one, number one, it makes you feel loved and valuable. You read John 3, 16, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Right there, maybe people have told you that you're not worth anything. Right there, God says you're worth a lot. You're loved, you're valuable. That's the first thing it does for you. The second thing it does for you is it gives you direction. Maybe your mom and dad never taught you just basic morality, how to treat people, how to behave. That's another way Christianity helps you. Immediately, immediately you got some rules on here's how you live, here's how you behave, here's how you treat people, here's how you resist temptation. Note this. Temptation is always attractive to people that are in pain or rage. If you got a temptation in your life that you can't seem to beat, you might look, you might look deeper and say, am I trying to use this temptation to, to cover my anger? Or to, or, or to, to kind of sab it? Or my pain? A lot, a lot of times the only way you can break a temptation is you, you just got first of all, the first thing you got to do is you got to stop being angry. Or you got to stop feeling sorry for yourself. You, you are... You are at the mercy of temptation if you are an angry person or if you feel sorry for yourself. You are just, there, there's not, not going to be a good way to beat it unless you first of all come to terms with, I don't have a right to be mad and I don't have a right to feel sorry for myself. And then I like, religious perspective, Christianity is outward focused. Victimhood is inward focused. That's the third great benefit is that God forces you to think about someone other than yourself. If you're going to become a Christian, the first thing God's going to say, because you, you, you're, you're, first thing God's going to say, number one, you've got to stop thinking so much about yourself. You've got to start thinking about God and other people. You're not the center of the universe, and you've got to stop acting like it. God offers you something more than survival. More than God offers you something, more than just surviving. He wants you to flourish. Jesus said, I came that they might have life and have it abundantly in John 10. I want to look at some passages here. This is one of them. Romans 8, 37. Either believe it or scratch it out. You know, sometimes you just got to come to terms with, either I'm going to believe it or scratch it out because I never seem to be using it. The passage says, but in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. That sounds like far more than just surviving. That sounds like far more than being yourself as a victim. How about this passage? Or this, this statement. When I was thinking about Ephesians 6, here's how you're pictured. Here's how the average, average, here's how each Christian is pictured. Just, the, just here's a child of God. Okay, this is just you. This is the child of God. And you are pictured as a soldier armed. The full armor of God. And your picture is having truth and a breastplate and your feet are shod and you've got the gospel and you've got a shield and you've got a sword. And I don't know if you, we view ourselves that way. I think a lot of Christians don't view, your, view themselves as a soldier armed to the teeth, we view ourselves like as someone in a refugee camp, in rags and something over our head and eating gruel. I mean, how do you picture yourself? Are you a refugee? Are, are you just like a refugee that has just barely enough to survive and rags on your back? Or are you just soldier armed to the teeth? Which are you? Book of Revelation repeatedly offers this promise and it starts in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 7, but it runs throughout the whole book almost to the point that you might say you get tired of the expression of why is he saying that so much? But the expression is, to him who overcomes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life. That statement, to him who overcomes. Verse 7, verse 11, verse 17, verse 26, same chapter. To him that overcomes, it, the letter starts with it, the letter ends with it. Revelation 21, 7. To him who overcomes. The word overcomes there means to be a victor. To triumph. To be victorious against these things.
There's a danger of viewing yourself as a victim. One of the great things about the gospel is it strips you of your victim identity. It removes it. You know what? One reason that you should not allow people to... One reason you don't want to be pegged victim. You don't want that identity. You know why? No one expects anybody of a victim. You do that. There, if you needed help with something, there are certain people you would not ask because you would say to yourself, they've been through enough, right? They, 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 they have been through so much. They are suffering or whatever, all right? You want someone to help you do something. There's probably certain people you're not thinking about asking because you've already put them in the category of, oh, they, they, they've been through too much. You don't, if anyone's doing that to you, you want to tell them, hey, take me on that category. It doesn't do me any good if you look at me and say, poor soul. Poor, poor soul. That doesn't do me any good. I'm not going to grow. Do not, do not put me or any other Christian in that category of poor, poor soul. Expect something of me. No one expects anything of suffering people. And you die. If you have relationships with people that no one expects anything of you, you need to go up and say, now, would you stop expecting something on me? Would you not view me as poor, poor soul? Because I need accountability. I need something to do. I need some hard things in my life. I need some challenges. Not only that, but if you view yourself as damaged, you're going to avoid challenges. And that's not any good for us. But there's nothing I can do. There's, I get so tired of hearing that, but there's nothing we can do. In Acts chapter 4, verse 29, when the church was persecuted, the apostles didn't come together and say, well, there's nothing we can do. Have we fallen into the trap of conduct? Do you feel that way? Well, there's nothing we can do. Uh, you go to a store and you're bringing something back. Uh, too bad, that's your fault. Uh, I guess there's nothing we can do. I guess I'll just have to accept bad service. You ever get that feeling? Just, I guess I'll just have to accept that. I guess, I guess I'll just have to accept that at that place there's always going to be a long, slow line. I guess we just got to accept that. There's nothing we can do. And we're told that, we're told that. What do we do about this? Well, there's nothing you can do about that. Huh? People tell you that. Well, there's nothing you can do, Mark. Here's what the apostle said. Lord, take note of their threats and grant that thy bondservants may speak thy word with all confidence. If God is for us, who's against us? Romans 8, 31. How does that sound like? Well, there's nothing you can do. And what is the surpassing greatness of his power towards us who believe? Ephesians 1.19 doesn't sound like there's nothing you can do. Whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And notice how, what that means if you're baptized. If you've been baptized, you fit in that verse. That verse is not saying, and only certain people born of God. Only certain level type Christians. No. Whatever is born of God. If you are baptized and your conversion was genuine, then you got it within you to overcome the world. Whatever is truly born of God overcomes the world. Truly converted people overcome the world. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Yeah. Yeah, I can't do anything about it. Oh, yeah, we can. We can do a lot. We can pray. We can spread the word. We can scatter the salt. We can endure with joy. Yeah, I'm enduring, but I'm going to have a great attitude. I'm going to let my light shine. I'm going to glorify him in this situation. I'm going to proclaim his excellencies. I'm going to tell everyone I can how great God is. I'm going to refuse to give up. I'm going to overcome evil with good in the Romans chapter 12. 
I'm going to reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering. 2 Timothy 4 2. I'm going to do that. I'm going to show compassion. I'm going to keep my behavior excellent. 1 Peter chapter 2. Resist the temptation to be controlled by fear. Make your decision based on facts. Lead with your head, not your heart always. Are we grateful for the good people in our lives? People that are present, you got in your, you got in your life. The world is filled with people, and the Bible's filled with people that could have got all caught up in their past. Rahab could have just stopped and said, I was a harlot and I can't get over that. That could have held her back. Moses could have, Moses could have said, I tried to deliver God's people once when I killed the Egyptian. And, and, and I got no gratitude, and I got no thanks, and ran me out of Egypt, and I'm never doing that again. God could have shown up at the burning bush and said, here's what I want you to do, and Moses could have said, no thanks. Last time I tried that, I didn't get any gratitude. Last time I tried that, I fell on my face. Abigail. Abigail could have got caught up in the fact I'm married to a fool. And, and let that define her for the rest of her life. Paul could have said, I was a persecutor of a church and I can't get beyond that. Peter denied Christ three times. He could have said, I will never amount to anything. How can a man who denied Christ three times ever amount to any way? Anything. I'm just going to quit. Mark, when he left on the first journey, could have said, I'm not any good. Paul doesn't want me. And, I, and, 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 and he could have just let that hinder him. Yeah, I think we all could agree that if those people had done that, they'd been wrong. And the world would have been a poor place. I never find God telling anyone, you know what? You don't have to, you don't have to, you don't have to give thanks when you pray because you've, not, you've got nothing to be thankful for. I don't find God ever telling anybody that. Oh, in your case, that passage about in everything give thanks, you don't have to do that. Because you got a crummy life. <laughs> you, know, you don't got anything good in your life. Do you ever find God telling anybody that? That, oh, for you? Uh, no, you don't have to be grateful. In Philippians 4, verse 6, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, which means that everybody has something in their life, many things, to tell God thank you for it. We spend a lot of time listening to the devil and believing it. You're not worth much. Have you bought into that? You're not worth much. That's a lie. That is a big lie. Matthew chapter 12. Let me give you one verse here. We could give many of them. Matthew chapter 12, verse 12. Jesus says, of how much more value than is a man than a sheep? You got value. Don't believe you're not worth much. Personal relationships are a threat. You don't want to get involved with people. You don't want people getting too close to you. Keep people at arm's length. Live a very guarded life. Don't let hardly anybody into your life. Keep people out. Keep people at arm's length. Because personal relationships are a threat. And that's a lie. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verses 9 through 11. Two are, better than, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if either of them falls, the one will lift up his companion. But woe to the one who falls when he has no one to lift him up. Furthermore, if two lie down together, they keep warm. How, but how can one be warm alone? And if one can overpower him who is alone, two can resist him. A cord of three strands is not quickly torn apart. You need friendships. Yeah, but if I let people too close into my life, they'll find out about me, and, and then we might disagree about stuff, and, and they're, uh, it, it's not worth the trouble. That's a lie. Effort and intent never pay off because life is never fair. Do you like this? No use even trying it, because if I put effort into it, I know 
I will not be rewarded. Galatians chapter 6, verse 9, let us not lose heart in doing good. For in due time we shall reap if we do not grow weary. But how many times have you tried something and it didn't work out? He said, that's what I get for trying. You know, no good deed ever goes unpunished. That's what I get. That's what I get for trying to go back to school. That's what I get for this. That's what I get for helping that person. That's what I get for talking. That's what I get for volunteering. Now they want me to do everything. It never pays off. All the other people get to pay off. I don't ever seem to get the breaks, and I'm working and stuff like that. That's a lie. God says it does pay off. No one could love you. No one could love you. Romans chapter 5, verse 8, that's a lie. The devil wants you to believe that. The devil is like a bad boyfriend, a really bad boyfriend. He spends all the paycheck. He comes home drunk. He beats you. He's a slob. He never does anything. That's what the devil's like. He's like a bad boyfriend. And what the devil says, no one could ever love you, so you might as well just stay here with me. And we need to say that's a lie. Romans chapter 5, verse 8. God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I don't need the devil. I don't need his companionship. You could be never happy. You're never going to be happy. And that's not true either. Philippians 4, 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. You are too far gone or you're too damaged to get better or do better. The woman that was caught in adultery was brought to Jesus. And, and they were trying to entrap him. The Jews had lost their right to the death penalty. So they're trying to put Jesus in this, between this rock and this hard place. They're trying to either make him look like he's inconsistent with what the law taught or getting him in trouble with the Romans or whatever. And he just said, oh, yeah, yeah, stoner, the person who's without sin, you throw the first stone. And they all realized that they're pretty hypocritical because they brought her, but not him. They're supposed to be both, both of them. But then he said this, and this has always impressed me. He said to the woman, neither do I condemn you. But he did not say, and you know what? God does not expect anything of you. He did not say, your life is so messed up that... I'm not going to give any other instruction to you. He did not say, you are a hopeless case. He said this, from now on, sin no more. Stop it. Don't live that way anymore. God expects something of you. Yeah, you were caught in adultery. Maybe you've been living that lifestyle. Quit. Stop it. Live differently. You are not created to do that. You are not created to live that way. Stop sinning. Stop living selfishly. It's almost like permission. Well, someone tell me to quit. God's saying, I'm telling you to quit. That says a lot. That says you're not too far gone. You're not too damaged to get better or do better. Avoid. Avoid these things. The victim identity. We live in a culture where a lot of people seem to want to have an identity. Almost like an actor's identity. Maybe they want to be the cowboy all the time, or, but they're not a cowboy. They don't even live in cowboy country or whatever. But people that want to have a certain persona. But here's, here's one that you want to avoid. There's a difference between being an individual with a past, and we've all got one, Versus an individual defined by their past. We're not defined by our past. We're defined by the fact that we're in Christ. And we are a new creature, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And if we're in Christ, all things are new. That's what defines us. I'm a new creature, not my past. Don't do this either. You know, misery can become a comfortable routine. This is one reason that some men keep choosing bad girlfriends 
And some women keep choosing bad boyfriends of, yeah, I know he's kind of going to be like the last one, but I at least know what to expect from that. I'm kind of comfortable in misery. I wouldn't know how to handle a good relationship. I wouldn't know how to handle prosperity. At least I know what to expect here. Avoid the temptation of going from one miserable relationship to another simply because it's familiar. It's familiar. This is a very subtle temptation when something bad has happened to you. You start using that to your advantage. You start manipulating people with something bad happened to me. There's a lot of secondary, there's a lot of secondary gains when you're suffering. One is you can manipulate people. That is, you tell people, or you send the message, you gotta be, you gotta be very careful with me. You can't say the things that you say to other people to me. You have to treat me differently. Avoid that. Avoid that. Or, would you do this for me because I know you feel sorry for me? I can ask more favors of you. Because everyone's, oh, we're really so feeling sorry for them. Avoid that. Don't do that. Don't, don't start enjoying the secondary gains. Particularly here for men. Pride can make you the center of the universe, but so can suffering. There's a lot of men out there that say, something bad happened to my past, therefore everyone's going to have to tiptoe around me from now on. Don't, don't do that. Don't become the center of the universe where everyone has to adjust to your mood. That's not what God designed a man to be. God designed a man to go out into the world and serve and help. Not, I'm here to be served. Not, everyone must adjust to me. Don't expect friends and family to pamper you if you're misbehaving. Then this one. What do I mean by that? Don't seek love from the devil. How many people have you known, and sometimes often it happens to women, that get involved with a man who is no good, he's abusive either verbally or physically or emotionally, he's no good, it's some boyfriend, he's no good, but it means everything in the world that that man loves her. Sometimes people do that with parents, parents they had that were just wicked and evil. And they're always trying, they're always fantasizing about a good relationship with that parent and want to, and love from that parent. You need to have the courage to admit when someone in your life is evil. If you're a woman who's dating a man who's abusive, that's the devil that's evil. Get out of that relationship. Don't seek love from the devil. Admit when that, that person's evil. You got to admit that. Abigail, my husband's a fool. Do not believe that your life depends on getting love from an evil person. That is... I will never be a whole person. I will never be who I need to be unless that person, that person tells me they love me. You know, the problem with that is what about all the people that really do love you? It is so fair, it is so fair to say to everybody else in your life who loves you, I can't function, I can't be a whole person. Why? Because this one person over here who means so much to me hasn't told me they love me, and you're going, but what about all the people who are? Do, do we don't matter? And what about, and what about God? Why is it that God's love doesn't matter to you? 
Do not hold everybody else hostage because you're not getting it from one particular person who happens to be the devil. Oh, I, I know what it's like to long for reconciliation and long for I just want this one person, this one person. But when we, when we make that the idol of our life, that I can't move on until I get it from that one person, doesn't God's love mean something to us? And Jesus' love, that has to trump. That has to trump whatever human beings are out, are out there. Don't fantasize about love from an evil person. Evil needs to be confronted. Daydream about love that God has for you. That's something to fantasize about, how much God loves you. And all the other people who really do love you. And you've got many. You've got many in your life. As we close this lesson, Ezekiel chapter 18. I like this passage. In Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 1, Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, What do you mean by using this proverb concerning the land of Israel, saying, The fathers eat sour grapes, but the children's teeth are set on edge. As I live, declares the Lord God, you surely, you're not going to use this proverb in Israel anymore. It looks like, here's what they were saying. Is that you can't overcome your environment. And the reason that they were wicked is because their parents had been wicked. And they can't break that cycle. That's ingrained. Not only that, not only that, but we got a, we got a situation here in this chapter. First, we, we, we've got an evil man described. Who does all these evil things. Verse 11, he eats at the mountain shrines. He defiles his neighbor's wife. He's a cheater. He runs around. He's a, he's a rolling stone. He oppresses the poor. He, he commits robbery. He doesn't restore a pledge. He lifts up his eyes to idols. He is no good. He lends money on interest, etc. Verse 14, behold, he's as his son. Somewhere along the line, some woman stays with him. Maybe there's a wife, even though he's cheating or running around. But he has, a, he has a child. Like a lot of people like that do. Yeah, I've got a son somewhere. I've got a son back in Carson City, or I've got a son down in Reno, or I've got a son somewhere from some relationship in the past. I've got a son somewhere. And, and then it says this. Behold, he has a son who has observed all his father's sins, which he's committed. He, he sees it. He grows up seeing it. Hears about it. it. It's not kept from the son. It's not hidden. And then it says, and observing does not do likewise. And then the verses that follow is the exact opposite of everything his father did. It's like this, this son looks at his father and says, I'm going to be the exact opposite of everything he was. Everything he did, I'm going to do the opposite of what he did. He does not eat at the mountain shrines, lift up his eyes to idols. He does not defile his neighbor's wife. He does not oppress anyone. He does not retain a pledge or commit robbery. But he gives his bread to the hungry, covers the naked with clothing. He keeps his hand from, from the poor, does not take interest or increase, but executes my ordinances, walks in my statutes, and says, he won't die. Now, verse 19. Yet you say... Why should the son not bear the punishment for the father's iniquity? Wait a minute. The Israelites said, that's not right. And I think our society probably would agree with that. It may not be the point they were making is, why doesn't the son, why doesn't the son share the guilt? Our society might not make that point. But what our society would, would say is, no, Mark, you can't break from an upbringing like that. You are defined by that. You can't ever be anything differently than what you saw growing up or how you were raised. That sticks with you the rest of your life. You can't break from that. And God says, no, I don't believe that. 
How refreshing. A lot of people in Israel expected the son to somehow forever be tied to, forever be tied to the sins of his dad. And God's vision for us instead is glorious. That you're not tied to things like that. The person who sins will die. The son will not bear the punishment for the father's iniquity. Nor will the father bear the punishment for the son's iniquity. The righteousness of the righteous will be upon himself. And the wickedness of the wicked will be upon himself. That the only thing on my head is what I've done. Is what I've done. The only thing on my cosmic account with God is what I've done or have not done. That's liberating. Nobody can charge anything to my bill. Nobody can put any credit on it or debit. Nobody can mess with my spiritual ATM card. The only one who can use it is me. Me. Now that's liberating. Maybe you're this, mor- you're this morning saying, I'm going to answer for myself. It's my life. And I'm not going to get another one. And I'm going to do it right. And the first thing I'm going to do is get my life right with God. Jesus said, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. If you haven't done that, this morning is an opportunity to do it. If you don't think you're quite there yet, if you've got some questions, just come to me after services and we'll get together and we'll, we'll study that. If you did that at some point in the past, but you've, you've forgotten it and you need to make your life right with God, This would be a time to do that as as well. We're here to try to help everyone we can make it to heaven. Because there's no greater work. There's no greater work than that. The only thing that's going to be important at the last day is whether you go into heaven or not. That's the only thing that will matter. Let's be standing and sing the invitation song.